Howdy. Welcome to the Texas A&M University College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences Peer Programs STEM Education Series. Are you feeling tired and grumpy lately? Perhaps you're not as healthy as you should be. Well, maybe these problems are more than the result of your late night study sessions or lack of exercise. Today, Dr. Deb Bell Peterson will present how and why organisms tell time. She'll explain how our biological or circadian clocks can influence everything from disease susceptibility to emotions. Welcome, Dr. Bell Peterson. Thank you, it's great to be here. Um, so let me just begin. So I'll start out with a question, um, and that is that if I asked you what time it is, what would you do? So most likely you would take a look at your watch or a clock on a wall. Um, and so in society, we live by these mechanical devices. They tell us when to go to sleep. We set our alarm clocks to tell us when to wake up, or also we look at our watches to know when it's time to eat lunch. Um, but while we're doing this in, our, on, in ourselves, we have our own internal timing mechanism that tells us what time of day it is. And this clock probably started ticking shortly after life appeared on Earth about three billion years ago. And it's one that's found in almost every organism. And this clock, which is our internal circadian clock, um, drives rhythms in behavior, in physiology, in our biochemistry, in gene regulation. And it has a, pr a very profound effect on all the things that we do each day. And so what I'm going to do then is tell you about this internal timing mechanism, how it works, and, and as you just heard, how it affects our uh, daily lives and our health. And so one of the most predictable features of life on Earth is the 24-hour cycle between day and night. And that is the result of the Earth's rotation on its axis every 24 hours. And throughout evolution, organisms were constantly exposed to these daily cycles. And because of that, it's not surprising that they've developed a timing mechanism centered around this 24-hour day that allows them to take advantage of the opportunities and also to be able to deal with the challenges that this cyclic environment imposes on them. So in the 24-hour environmental cycles, what we see are cycles of light-dark, of, of temperature, humidity, even barometric pressure. And this all in, in itself can relate to seasons as well. And so if you look out in nature, you'll see evidence of rhythms all over the place. So if you've ever had a mouse or a hamster as a, as a young child in your bedroom at night with a running wheel, what you know is that this hamster or mouse is active and eating and running on its wheel at night when your own clock is telling you that it's time to go to sleep. And then here in this little uh, movie, what you see is a seedling. This is a model plant system, um, Arabidopsis. And what you can visualize is that the leaves are opening and closing. So this is a time-lapse movie, so it's running faster than 24 hours, but the leaves will be open during the day and then closed at night. And what that does is it minimizes water loss that would occur during the nighttime, but opens up the leaves so that there's a lot of surface area for photosynthesis during the day when the sun is up. And if you've ever been around chickens and roosters, you know that roosters will crow uh, every morning. But if you really pay attention to what they're doing, what you find is that they'll crow just before the sun comes up so they can anticipate the 24-hour cycle of light and dark. And then on the bottom is a video showing a fungus. This is, a, again, a model organism called Neurospora crassa. And this is actually the model system that my lab uses to study circadian rhythms. And once a day, in constant environmental conditions, what will happen is that the clock will signal the organism to develop spores. And it's these spores that help to uh, disperse the fungus out in nature. So how are all of these rhythms that we see in our, in our everyday lives generated? And we can think of this happening in one of two ways. One is that, like an hourglass, 
they can respond precisely to cycles in their environment. So when the light comes on, there's a reaction. When the light goes off, there's a different reaction, just like flipping this hourglass over each day. However, when you isolate organisms from all of the different environmental, 24-hour environmental cues, the rhythms that we observe will actually persist. And this supports the idea that these rhythms are being regulated by an endogenous timekeeping mechanism, that they continue to run independent of these environmental cues. And so these daily rhythms that are controlled by an endogenous clock are able to provide external coordination with the environment, but also allows internal coordination. So ex for example, in a organism that is uh, complex like us, the internal clock can coordinate activities within us to occur at the appropriate times of the day. And this internal circadian, endogenous circadian clock provides organisms with an adaptive advantage. And that is that it allows them to prepare for those changes that occur in the environment, just like I mentioned with the rooster. And a really great example of this is this plant. This is a sunflower that's growing out in a field. And I'm gonna show you a movie. The sun is gonna come up in the east where the, right now the leaves are oriented, cross the sky and set in the west on the other side. And so I want you to just watch what's going on with this plant. So the sun is up in the east and now it's crossing the sky and you see the leaves are orienting towards where the sun is. And there's a few clouds, it's a little windy. And now nighttime is starting to set in. Now it's dark. And it's still dark. And then the sun comes up. And so what you can see is that this plant is orienting its leaves towards the sun even in the east before the sun comes up. So it's anticipating that in the next day, the sun is gonna rise at exactly the same place at exactly the same time. So it can orient its leaves, open them up, and maximize the time for photosynthesis. And so this is evidence that the clock provides this advantage to organisms. Now the sun is good for the plant for photosynthesis, but it can also be harmful. So the sun produces ultraviolet light, which can damage DNA. And so organisms also need to prepare for the sun to prevent that sort of damage. And they'll make protective proteins just before the sun comes up. So we make melanin in our skin and that protects us from the UV light. And our clock regulates the timing of melanin production so that we produce maximal amounts of melanin before the sun rises. Now, with all of this, there are certain properties of circadian rhythms, and those are listed on the side. So all circadian clocks in all organisms that have been examined share these properties. And that is that they have a endogenous clock that generates a rhythm and this rhythm in constant environmental conditions will free run with a period that's about a day. And that's where the name circadian comes from, about circa day diem in Latin. And this free running rhythm varies with different organisms. So the organism that my lab works with, Neurospora, has a free running rhythm of less than 24 hours. It's about 22 and a half hours. Whereas in humans, the free running rhythm is a little bit longer than 24 hours. It's about 25 hours. But this endogenous free running clock can get synchronized to the 24 hour environmental cycles by environmental cues such as light dark cycles and that will synchronize the clock to exactly 24 hours to allow it to anticipate and give the organisms the advantage that it does.
And then thirdly, the last canonical property of circadian rhythms is that the clock is temperature compensated. So this is an area of circadian rhythmicity that we don't really fully understand. We know that it makes a lot of sense, and that is that you don't want your clock to speed up when temperatures rise, like a biochemical reaction would, and you don't want your clock to slow down when it gets cold, or else it wouldn't be a very good timekeeping mechanism. So somehow the clock is buffered against changes in temperature that would change the rate of the clock. Now, I wanted to just give you a little bit of definition so that we can talk about uh, some of these things as we go along. As I've said, in a 24-hour light-dark cycle, the clock will be entrained to exactly 24 hours and we can measure the period of a rhythm, whether it's an activity rhythm, a biochemical rhythm, a physiological rhythm. And we do this by measuring the time that it takes to go through one full cycle. So here we see a trough in the first day and then a trough in the second day. And the period is the time that it takes from one trough to the next. You could do the same thing by measuring the peak. So a peak one day to the peak the next day. And then when an organism is put in constant environmental conditions, so no light dark cycle, no temperature cycle, the clock will free run with its endogenous period. And again, you can measure the period between two peaks or two troughs. And here I give the example of humans with a free running rhythm of about 25 hours. And then the amplitude of the rhythm is measured from the midpoint between the trough and the peak to the peak or from the midpoint to the trough. Now, we want to understand how the clock affects humans, but as you can imagine, it's very difficult to do experiments in humans. And so we um, use model organisms to try to understand the molecular and biochemical basis of the clock. But before I get into that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do know about humans. And this comes from volunteers who have allowed themselves to be put in constant environmental conditions so that scientists can monitor their rhythms. And this is an example of a, um, a scientist. His name is Michel Sifre. And he spent over 200 days in a cave in Del Rio, Texas. It's called Midnight Cave. And so he volunteered to put himself in that cave for almost a year and measure his activity rhythms, his body temperature rhythms, so the clock regulates body temperature, and also his mental alertness and his physical ability to react. And this activity record shows a little bit of what the data, um, what, what came out of his experiments. And on the top in the solid blue lines is when he's sleeping. And in the first 10 days, the activity rhythm is showing when he's still in natural environmental cycles, so 24 hour light dark cycles. And so that you can see he, in most days he goes to sleep around midnight and then he wakes up um, a little bit before, before noon. He's a, a bit of a long sleeper. And then the dotted lines show his activity um, during the day, when he's awake during the day. The triangles reflect his lowest body temperature. So in humans, the clock regulates rhythms and body temperature. We have our lowest temperature somewhere around 4 a.m. in the morning, and then our peak around 4 in the afternoon. So then after day 10, what we see in his record is when he goes into the cave. So now he's not being exposed to 24-hour environmental cycles and his clock is free running. So what you see is that he goes to sleep a little bit later each day. And that's reflecting this 25-hour clock. So he's starting one hour later each day because he's no longer synchronized. And then if you look at the triangles and see his body temperature rhythm, it's no longer synchronized such that it occurs just before, the low point occurs before he wakes up. Now his low point is actually right when he's going to sleep. So under these conditions of constant environmental 
um, no environmental cycles, constant conditions. He's lost internal coordination. And in addition, although it's not shown on this record, his eye, hand-eye coordination also decreased. Um, his uh, mental acuities, the tests that he performed on himself, also decreased over the length of time. So then in the, in the pink on the bottom is where he now comes out of the cave, and he's now again exposed to the 24-hour light-dark cycle. And so immediately his sleep-wake cycle resynchronizes to the 24-hour cycle, but his body temperature takes a while to get reset, to now have its low point just before he wakes up. And this is exactly what we find during jet lag. So when you fly across time zones, you can force yourself to sleep and wake up in your new time zone, but it takes several days for your internal clock to coordinate all the other rhythmic events that occur to the new time zone. And I'll come back to that point in a little bit. Now, this is jumping um, uh, quite a few years, but we now have incredible technology to look at what genes are regulated by the clock in various organisms. And this is using a um, technique called RNA-seq, where you can look at every single RNA from an organism's genome and know what RNAs are being expressed. And if we do these experiments in all the different model systems that are used to study circadian rhythms, what we find is that up to half of the genome is regulated by the clock at the level of transcript abundance. So this is, to me, astounding. So it, it indicates how important the clock is to the life of an organism, where half of its genome is regulated by the clock. And if we look at the functions of the genes in mammalian cells, what we find is that many of them are involved in metabolism, in regulating cell division, in our immune system, in genes that are associated with mental well-being, also sleep, and just overall physiology and our behavior. And so what I like to tell people is when we think about this, what we realize is that we are physiologically different people at different times of the day. And that's going to have a huge effect on our overall health. I have a question real quick. Yeah, absolutely. So we'd like to know here, and this is kind of relevant, I think, for some of these kids who've just gone through daylight savings time. Yes, exactly. Does that impact our biological clock at all, or is it just such a short No, in fact, there have been studies. It's really incredible. Just that one hour change, we see about a 500% increase in car accidents. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> in, um, and in other types of events that occur. I, I think for myself, I notice it not on um, Sunday when it happens, but on Monday when you have to when you have to wake up with your alarm clock, you feel a little bit uh, more tired than you normally would. So absolutely, and it will take a couple of days to fully reset all of the clocks within the body to that new time. Right. So yeah, okay. a really Very great question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so if we, if we then take a bigger picture look, not at specific genes, but look at some of the rhythms that we observe in humans, um, let's start here at 6 p.m. So right about 6.30, we have a peak in blood pressure. So um, I'll come back to this in a minute. And then about 7 p.m. late in the afternoon is our highest body temperature. And then around 9 p.m., we start secreting a hormone called melatonin. And melatonin is what's going to activate our processes that are going to stimulate sleep. And so after melatonin levels increase, we're going to start to feel a little more sleepy, and that's going to promote sleep. Around 2 a.m. is when we have our deepest sleep, and about 4.30 a.m. is our lowest body temperature. And then just before we wake up, there's a, a very sharp rise in blood pressure. And then around 7.30 a.m., melatonin secretion will go down. 
And then around 10 a.m., we have our highest alertness, so you all should be very alert right now listening. And then it's in the afternoon, if you are an athlete, this is when you want to do all of your competitions because around 2.30 is when we have our best coordination, our fastest reaction time about 3.30, and then our greatest cardiovascular fitness occurs around 5 p.m. And then this will cycle again each day. Now, um, I don't know how quickly you guys can answer, but I'm going to ask you a question and see who answers. So when do you think would be the, the greatest time of risk for a heart attack? We have one that says when your blood pressure is the highest. Okay, so that would be at 6.30 p.m. Okay, so that's a good guess. Uh, any, is there any others? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's actually at 6.45 a.m. And that's because even though it's not the highest blood pressure that you have throughout the day, it's the biggest change. So if there's any arterial uh, plaques, when the blood pressure quickly rises to help you wake up in the morning, that's the time of day when the most serious heart attacks occur. I don't know if anyone suffers from asthma. Um, but our clock also regulates bronchial constriction. And so that occurs, again, just uh, right before we go to sleep. And so if you have an asthma, uh, if you suffer from asthma, the time of day when you'd most likely have a serious asthma attack is at night. And so if you think about that as well, if you're taking medicines to try to help you deal with asthma attacks, the time of day that, that medicines are going to be most effective is the time of day when the bronchial um, constriction occurs. So we have two questions yes. mm -hmm. about Great. this clock. Yeah. The first one is they'd like to know, is this generally true for all humans or do you notice variations in individuals at all? Right, so this would be generally true for all humans that have a wild type or normal clock. There are certainly um, circadian diseases where there are individuals who have mutations in clock genes that affect the ability of the clock to reset. So they may be constantly free running. There could also be mutations that affect the, um, the ability of the clock to uh, maintain its normal period, even in, in training conditions. And so there are night owls, there are um, morning larks, and so there are people that have genetic mutations that affect the phase of their clock. So they may secrete melatonin later and go to sleep later. They may secrete melatonin earlier and go to sleep earlier. Right. That's very interesting. But the general population will this. be, yeah. Um, I don't, if anyone has ever heard of seasonal affective disorder, mm -hmm. So that is a circadian disorder where the individuals don't respond to light as well. So they don't synchronize as well as a, a wild type clock would. And so they suffer from um, depression, particularly in the winter when there's less light that they're exposed to be, and they're not as sensitive mm -hmm. to the light. So they don't synchronize well to the 24 hour day. And now they will be free running with a 25 hour rhythm. And they are not depressed when they're in sync with the rest of the population, but as they free run with their longer hour and they get out of sync, that's when they become depressed. That is so very interesting. And so light treatment, a very bright uh -huh. light, that's the best way to treat seasonal wow. affective disorder. We have one more. Yeah. And they say that infants don't seem to have this 24 hour clock. Mm. How long does it take them to develop this? Yeah, it's a really clock? great question. Um, so it takes some time. And this is an area still of great interest for scientists in understanding how the clock actually develops. But there have been studies done in infants um, looking at their feeding cycles, their body temperature rhythms, and their sleep-wake cycle. And it usually takes two to three months for their clock to be fully functional. 
Um, but it's really astounding to watch, to look at the data and see initially, they're, as, as any parent would know, that they're completely arrhythmic for a month, a month and a half, and then slowly the rhythms start to consolidate until eventually they become exactly 24 hours. Right. And they have a follow-up, they wanna know um, why don't infants have this clock? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't really have a good answer for that. The only, the only thing I can say is that this is the same for every um, organism that is a multicellular organism that develops into um, a different uh, mm -hmm. uh, complicated organism that initially when they're born or when they hatch, they don't have a, a functional clock. It takes some time for that clock to develop. And it is most likely related to when the clock genes get expressed, that they need something that the early cells don't have to get that kicked into gear. Um, most of the work on this is now being done in Drosophila, where they can trace from a fly larvae mm -hmm. to an adult fly and look at the expression of the clock genes. And initially, there's no expression of the genes that are needed to produce the clock until later stages in development. The, but then it, it's sort of the chicken and the egg. Why aren't they expressed? And that we just don't know right, the answer right. to yet. Well, thank you. Those are mm. great questions and good answers. Yeah, great questions. <laughs> OK. Um, so I, so I, as I said, we are physiologically different at different times of the day. We undergo different behaviors under control of our circadian clock. So with that information, without even talking about mechanisms really yet, we know a lot. And what our clock, um, what, this, what these rhythms tell us is that our physiology is different depending on the time of day. And this we can relate to different drugs that people take for different health reasons. And these drugs can, because of these changes, either be more effective or more toxic, depending on the time of day that they're administered. So you all are too young, uh, but many older adults have to take statins. And these statins are compounds that inhibit an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase that's made in the liver that produces cholesterol. So many older individuals have to try to take um, something that will help them lower their cholesterol levels because their liver makes too much cholesterol. So these statins, if they are taken at the right time of day, are very effective. And the reason they need to be taken at the right time of day is because HMG-CoA reductase levels are under control of the clock. These levels peak at night and they trough during the day. So a statin taken at night is very effective because its target is there. But a statin taken during the day really has no beneficial effects at all because its target isn't even there. So any individual taking statins needs to take it at night in order to lower cholesterol levels. Another interesting um, drug is acetaminophen, and this is the, the uh, functional compound in Tylenol. So we take acetaminophen to try to minimize pain. And acetaminophen gets metabolized by the liver, and when it does, it, it produces a toxin. And that toxin can cause liver damage, but it gets detoxified by another enzyme called glutathione. And glutathione is under control of the clock, such that it peaks during the day and it troughs at night. So any, um, any pain medicine that contains acetaminophen, like Tylenol, if it's taken at night, it can be much more toxic to the liver than if taken during the day. And we now know that most of the liver disease that occurs in developed nations that use acetaminophen for pain is due to acetaminophen toxicity and overdoses. Um, and to bring this even a little bit further, this is a little small, so hard to see, but out of the 100 best-selling drugs that are on the market that humans take right now for many different diseases, over half of them target an enzyme that is under control of the clock. 
And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data yet to know if if these drugs, when taken at different times of the day, would be more beneficial and or more toxic at other times of the day. And so there's a lot of work that still needs to go on to try to test some of these drugs now that we know that their targets are clock controlled to see if we can alter their efficacies and toxicities at different times of the day. Now, in addition to our changes in physiology that occur under control of the clock and this um, area of what we call chronopharmacology, testing drugs at different times of the day, when the clock is disrupted either by mutation or by living against the clock like a shift worker would do, that's going to have significant effects on our health. And as I said earlier, we, we have a difficult time obviously studying clocks in humans at a basic level, but about 20% of our workforce works at night rather than during the day. And as you know, our clock is telling us that we should be sleeping and not active at night. A shift worker is essentially living against their clock. They're forcing themselves to sleep during the day and forcing themselves to be active and eating and being awake during the night. And what we find is when we study shift workers that they suffer from many different, many different types of diseases that are associated with all of these functions that the clock regulates, like coronary heart disease. They have increased rates of infections. They suffer from metabolic syndrome, so that includes obesity, type 2 diabetes, um, and they suffer from certain types of cancers, including breast cancer. And I'm going to show you this amazing slide next. And this is a perfect example of what happens if a mammal lives against its clock. So these are two mice that were fed a high fat diet. Mice are nocturnal, we're diurnal, but mice are nocturnal, they're active in eating at night. So these two mice were given the exact same diet. One was fed only during the day when they should be sleeping and not active. One was fed only at night when they would normally be eating. So you can probably guess which one is which. So the lean mouse is the mouse that was fed at night and the um, very obese mouse is the one that was fed during the day. So essentially by living against its clock, this mouse is having severe consequences. <clears throat> and um, we see the same thing in humans. So in shift workers, as I mentioned, they suffer from metabolic syndrome. So if they force themselves to eat at night, then they generally uh, will become obese. And the reason for that is because we can we can override the clock regulation of sleep, but because we're so exquisitely sensitive to the light-dark cycle, as soon as we see light, even a shift worker, when they get off from work and they see light, that keeps their clock running as a diurnal clock. So all of the enzymes that would normally break down food that's eaten during the day are still only going to be produced during the day and not at night. And so by eating at night, they don't metabolize food properly and it gets stored as fat rather than broken down into energy. All right, I have a couple more questions. Yeah, great. We have students that want to know um, if all night study sessions <laughs> are more detrimental than beneficial. Yeah, <laughs> so great question. Um, I would say in limited quantities, I, well, all night I would never recommend because I mean, obviously, if you're a student, you want to be slowly preparing, you know, study a little bit each day and don't try to cram at night because you'll never remember things long term. You might remember for a short period of time, but you don't make those connections that you need to for long term memory. Um, 
So will it will it cause disease? Probably not if you do it, you know, just every once in a while. You know, that's going to happen. But this is this is more long-term shift work and long-term living against your clock. Okay. And then this is a, a similar question. It may have the same answer, but they want to know about stimulants that you might take to keep you awake. Legal, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the no dose or Mountain Dew or coffee, you know, something that keeps you alert and awake. How does that affect your physiology? Yeah. So again, I'd say short term, you know, used occasionally as needed would be okay, but you would not want to use those every day. That would absolutely have detrimental effects. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so, so I think this is just an amazing um, piece of data showing how important the clock is. So the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is this relationship with um, cancer. So um, we know that mice that have mutations in their clock system have increased tumor production and also cancers that do arise are much more aggressive, so the progression is, is very fast in, in these animals. But we don't really understand the molecular and biochemical link between the clock and cell division. All we know is that when the clock is screwed up, then that's going to affect the regulation of the cell cycle. On the plus side is just knowing that the clock plays a role in cell division gives us some really unique opportunities in chemotherapy. So um, some, well, let me just step back. So chemotherapy, the target is usually uh, DNA replication. So what the chemotherapeutic drugs do is they target cells that are rapidly dividing and rapidly replicating their DNA. If the clock is regulating cell division, so that it occurs at certain times of the day, but not at all different times of the day, what you can do is use that information to target rapidly dividing cells at the appropriate times of day when normal cells are not dividing, but the cancer cells are continuously dividing. And so this chronotherapy or clock therapy has been effective in treating certain cancers like lung cancer, breast cancer, kidney cancer, ovarian cancer. And what's done now is to use a pump to deliver the chemotherapeutic drugs at the time of day when the cancer cells are continuously dividing but the normal cells are not dividing. And that makes the drugs more effective but less toxic against normal cells. So there's a fine line with chemotherapy. You want to kill the cancer cells and not harm the normal cells. But there's usually some toxic effects. And a really good example of this is a drug called oxaliplatinin. And this drug was developed as a chemotherapeutic drug by a major pharmaceutical company. And they put this drug through human testing, and they had to stop the drug um, in the testing procedure because of toxicity issues. So it was pulled out of testing and nothing was done for it for a very long time. But then as we started to better understand the link between the clock and cell division, um, some of these drugs were re-examined. And now oxaliplatinin is the most widely used chemotherapeutic drug for treating colorectal cancers. It's very effective if given at night and not toxic at night, whereas it's highly toxic and not give, you can't give enough of it to be effective because of the toxicity during the day. Um, so, so that gives you sort of an overview of the importance of the clock in human health and how we can take advantage of, of what we know. But I want to tell you a little bit about how we are working to understand how the clock works. And I'm running over time already, so I'm going to do this just a little quickly. Um, but basically, in humans, the clock, the master clock is localized to a region of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. You can lesion this part of the brain, it's in the hypothalamus, with a laser and destroy the clock. You can take an, a mouse, say, where you've destroyed this SCN, and then 
transplant wild type SCN back in and that will restore the clock. So it was clear if you wanted to understand the organization of the mammalian clock in humans, you needed to focus on the SCN. And this really key experiment was done where David Welsh, who's at uh, University of California, San Diego, took a gene called the clock gene that we know cycles and fused it with firefly luciferase. And then this was transformed into a mouse and he looked at the SCN. And this is a time-lapse video of this gene being expressed rhythmically in the SCN. So the clock is functioning in these cells. And then he dispersed the neurons and looked at individual single neurons from the SCN and showed that the rhythm remained. And why this is important is because what it says is that the clock functions within a single cell. And that was key because that told us we could use very simple model systems and look at the cellular nature of the clock to understand the entire circadian system. And when we look at the clock, we realize that it's made of three parts. There's a circadian oscillator. So this, if we think about a wristwatch, this would be the gears and cogs of the wristwatch. So that's what keeps time. And it can be synchronized to the environmental cycle by, through input pathways that bring information from the environment to the oscillator. And then it sends information out to the rest of the organism through output pathways to control those rhythms in behavior, in physiology, and in gene expression. And so in order to understand what makes up this oscillator, what was done was to use genetic approaches. So you could take an organism that had a functional clock, mutagenize it with um, different mutagens that would cause mutations in the DNA sequence, and then isolate mutant strains that had alterations in period of whatever circadian rhythm was being assayed. And so very early genetics were done in flies, in Neurospora, our fungal model system, and in mice. And mutants were identified that showed that these mutants could either cause arrhythmicity, long periods, or short periods. And that was the same in all of these organisms. And what that led to was a unifying mechanism for circadian clocks in eukaryotic systems. And it's really very simple. So it is a molecular feedback loop where an activating element or elements turn on the expression of clock genes so the levels go up. These clock genes encode proteins that are inhibitory and they feed back onto the activating elements to shut them down. So now the levels of the clock genes go down but then eventually these inhibitory elements get degraded and then that allows the activating elements to restart the cycle the next day. So this is a, a very simple molecular feedback loop that is the basis of circadian timing in all model systems. And then this oscillator will control downstream events that regulate overt rhythmicity and can be synchronized to the environmental cycle. And this work in Drosophila and understanding the molecular nature of the clock was, was what was the basis of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine this year in 2000, well, in 2017, that was awarded to three circadian researchers, good friends of mine, um, Jeff Hall, Michael Roshbash, and Michael Young. And they discovered and described the molecular oscillator in Drosophila. So this has been a really exciting year for everyone who studies circadian rhythms because of the recognition that th these um, very uh, prominent researchers in the field were awarded. So I think then, are there questions or should I keep going? Um. Oh, I, I'll keep about. it. Yeah, okay, a minute. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned, we use Neurospora as our model system. And I wanted, I'm just going to skip a little bit here 
This is the model oscillator of Neurospora. So this is the positive element. It's made up of two proteins, white collar one and white collar two. They activate the clock gene called frequency. Freak is the inhibitor of the white collar complex. And so this is in a fungal system, this clock mechanism is exactly the same as our cells clock mechanism. And so one of the things that we've been focusing on now that we understand the basics of the oscillator is how does this oscillator signal through output pathways to regulate rhythms? And so again, we can turn to genetics to help us to identify key components of this regulation. So we can take our oscillator and in cells and that will drive rhythms in gene expression, about half of the genome. And if we look at any one particular gene, if we mutagenize the strains, then we can look for things that become arrhythmic. And we actually use reporters and machines that can help us do this in high throughput. And one of the things that we discovered is that the clock regulates a very highly conserved signaling pathway um, called a MAP kinase pathway. These MAP kinases regulate downstream effector molecules. They will regulate other kinases, transcription factors that will regulate gene expression, including genes involved in stress responses, but importantly, cell division. So I told you about the link between the clock and cell division that we don't really understand it. And this is now giving us information about how this regulation might take place using this very simple model system. So this shows rhythms in the accumulation of active and phosphorylated MAP kinase over the course of a day. You can see there's a very robust rhythm in the levels of the kinase that peaks during the late night to very early morning. So what we think then is that during the day, the MAP kinase pathway is active under control of the clock. That in turn is gonna regulate um, things that are needed for controlling cell division and DNA replication, but then it's inactive at night. And this same pathway is conserved in us. So our uh, MAP kinase pathway is important in regulating cell division, stress responses, and also cell death. And so the, we think then that our studies to uncover how the clock signals to regulate rhythms in gene expression is going to help us to understand the basic mechanisms of how the clock regulates cell division and, and diseases associated with that. So now we can take advantage of this information, and we've shown that the clock regulates this MAP kinase in mammalian cells. So it peaks during the day, and it's low at night. Um, but interestingly, in cancer cells, this rhythm is abolished, and the activity of the MAP kinase is high and constant at all times of day. And this MAP kinase, the high levels of activity, has been associated with many different types of cancers. And several pharmaceutical companies have developed drugs to inhibit this MAP kinase. But again, like we saw with the oxaloplatinum, the toxicity is too high, and so it has never been used in patients successfully. So now that we know that the clock regulates rhythms in the activity in normal cells, we can approach this using chronochemotherapy and target chemotherapeutic drugs during the night when the activity is low in normal cells, but it's high all the time in the cancer cells. And the cancer that we are looking at is glioblastoma. And this is a cancer that is um, one of the most difficult cancers to treat. So we started with the most difficult. And what we showed was that if we give one of the drugs that the pharmaceutical companies have developed, called VX745, against this MAP kinase, if we give the drug during the day, it doesn't have much of effect, an effect. What we're looking at is the ability of these cells to invade tissue. And so there's not much of a, a there's some, but not much of an effect compared to normal cells. And however, if we give it at night, what we find is that the drug brings the invasive 
invasiveness of these glioblastoma cells down to what we would see in a normal cell. So we're really excited about the opportunities to be able to use this drug um, at some point, hopefully, in patients, but only at specific times of the day. So overall, um, what I've told you then is that the clock mechanism is important in our lives and the lives of all organisms that have it. It's based on a very simple uh, molecular feedback loop and that this oscillator then signals through output pathways to control highly conserved um, signaling pathways that are important in cell division and also stress responses. And so the clock uh, controls rhythms in about half of our genome, making us physiologically different at different times of the day, and that can influence how we can uh, deal with certain pharmaceutical agents and also can be associated with disease in individuals that have mutations that affect their clock or if they live against their clock for long periods of time. And then as I mentioned, my lab is interested in understanding how the clock regulates rhythmicity. And one of the things we focused on is these highly conserved MAP kinase pathways that are linked to the regulation of cell division and that might provide useful tools in the clinic, but also basic information on how the clock regulates cell division. And um, then this is leading to novel approaches for uh, using time of day in chemotherapy treatments. So I just wanted to let you know that um, if anyone is interested in circadian clocks, we have a center for research on circadian rhythms here at the Texas A&M campus. And these are some of the individuals that are, um, have labs that focus on circadian rhythms using all different model systems from um, neurospora to flies to mammalian cells. And here's a picture of my lab and some of the people that we collaborate with. Well, we have one quick question okay. to close us out. Great. And they want to know, does our circadian clock impact um, hunger signals? Uh, uh, it's kind of a yeah. little off of <laughs> what exactly you were talking about. No, but, but it does. Question. Yeah, so there are uh, specific um, hormones that affect our, um, that stimulate hunger, and, and we feel that stimulation. And yes, they are regulated by the clock. Right. And so not only do you want to look at your watch to know when it's lunchtime, or you don't need to, usually your stomach will start to tell you when it's, when it's time. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was a fascinating presentation and interesting to know how um, that we're pre-coded with things that make our body work just right. So Great. thanks again for joining us today. We hope to see you next week when Dr. Lauren Scow will talk to us about the human genome. Until then, if you'd like to learn more about STEM or veterinary science, we encourage you to visit our website. It's peer, P-E-E-R, dot tamu, dot edu. We'll see you next time.